Thank you so much for joining me in this conversation. I will dive right in and ask you to tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do, and then we'll go more into your story. I've spent about 20 years almost now in life sciences consulting, so sort of working with Big Pharma, mainly on the intersect of business and IT, working in R&D, so sort of drug development and things like that, through to commercial and other parts of the business as well. But really just trying to kind of understand and, and how can you practically apply some of the new and emerging tech to address the business challenges that life sciences organizations face. So that's kind of what I, I do for a living. What are some of the big business challenges that life science organizations face? Particularly for R&D, it can be quite manual and quite labor intensive. So it's also quite a fragmented kind of landscape. So the consequence of that is there's quite a lot of inefficiency there. And when you're trying to get new treatments to market and new treatments to health authorities or file to health authorities for approval and things like that, you want to be able to do that in as efficient way that you can within the context of the regulated environment in which you're operating. So, yeah, that's one of the things that we often we look at how we can use the AI to, to be able to achieve that. Tell me a little bit more about your background. How did you end up in this role? How did I end up doing what I'm doing? Yes. <laughs> I actually stumbled into life sciences. It wasn't what I did as a degree or anything. I did a math degree. I then did a business degree. And, and the outcome of that was that I decided I liked variety. And so I ended up in consulting because that was one of the professions that kind of give you that variety. And then I did one project in the life sciences with a life sciences customer and then another project and another project. And I guess the rest is history. And I subsequently did my PhD in global e-health. And that's sort of when I started to kind of get more engaged in sort of the patient side of things. So what are the benefits for patients around some of these new technologies that are out there? So, yeah, that's kind of how I ended up doing what I'm doing and the route that I took. And I think for me, I'm sort of understanding some of the societal challenges that exist because I'm a very purpose-driven individual. So I need to have a reason to get out of bed in the morning and do what I do and feel as though I'm making an impact and things and contributing to some of the more complex problems that we face in a society. And how can I sort of play it and contribute to addressing those? And some of these complex problems are you know, there's not one straight solution to them. And that's also part of the sort of mental stimulation that comes from working in the industry and why I think I've stayed in it for so long was just because there are some really exciting and interesting problems and opportunities out there that still need to be addressed. Especially, I mean, life science and health, there's nothing more yeah. human outcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Than you are actually impacting people's the care. lives. Of a yeah. human being, and then obviously that's going to ripple out into yeah, society. Yeah. There's nothing clearer yeah. than that. I would love to explore, you know, you, you mentioned being purpose-driven and your big rallying cry for right. a while has been gender equity yeah. in healthcare. Talk to me about when you encountered this, like when did you discover that there was a gender health gap? I would say probably I started to see sort of examples of it in the work that I've been doing. And also when I was doing my PhD, you sort of start to get exposed to different things. So it was probably about five, six years ago, something like that, that I started to sort of go, there's some stuff here that needs to be sorted. What were the, some of the things that you were being exposed to? Well, it's things like I learned that, you know, women couldn't participate in clinical trials until 30 years ago, for example. So some of the treatments that are out there and available in the market that people are being prescribed were not necessarily built or tested on women when they were originally kind of developed and approved. So that often means that women either end up with the wrong dosage of treatment that's being prescribed to them or they suffer from a lot more adverse events associated with the treatment. So for me, that was kind of like, I guess, a shocking revelation, really, in terms of why is that the case? And I think also I started to learn that women were often longer to be diagnosed. And if they were diagnosed, could be misdiagnosed, because a lot of what we know about the human body and how it is affected by some of the treatments that are available are built on male models. And therefore, they don't take into account some of the things that are specific to women in terms of, you know, the hormonal changes that you go through at different stages of your life and, and things like that. Some of the, you know, genetic makeup that we have that means that we respond differently to the treatments that are there. And so that felt to me that was something that needed to be 
address. And, you know, there's a lot of talk about it. One of the things that we know across all industries, actually, is that there's a lot of underinvestment in women-led organisations, but also in terms of addressing some of the health issues that women face. And there are certainly some conditions that are much more prevalent in women than they are in men. I'm talking about things like MS or Alzheimer's and those sorts of conditions, even cardiovascular disease. When you imagine somebody having a heart attack, you often imagine it being a man. You don't necessarily think of it as being a woman. And some of the symptoms that are presented by women who are having a heart attack is different. I mean, it looks different. It, it feels different. And that's something that Often there's a lack of awareness around, but actually there's a lot of education that needs to happen on also research and science that needs to go behind that to address that sort of knowledge gap, but also the data gap that exists around those and some of those conditions. Conversely, you know, there's also this pervasive and strange myth about how women can handle yes. pain better than men. I believe that there was something that came out last year. There was this viral thing that came out that women's menstrual pain is basically like what men experience in terms of pain level for a heart attack. And yet we have to go through it every month. So the assumption is, well, they have to go through it every month so they can bear pain better. But really it's no, we are in pain and we need more treatment and more care around it. There's a lot of misconceptions around pain and how that's sort of managed and interpreted. And I think that's also one of the things why women are later to be diagnosed with a lot of conditions as well. It's often attributed to things like lifestyle choices or stress, mental sort of the environment in which, you know, they've got a lot on their plate, you know, they're busy raising a family and working and da 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 all these sorts of things, which of course, there are women out there that are doing those things, but that's not necessarily the cause of the condition or the pain and, and that they're experiencing. So yeah, so I, I think there's a lot of misconceptions around it, and there's a lot of lack of scientific evidence around it, some of these conditions. And that's not just in terms of reproductive and sexual health or maternal health or anything like that, but just in the broader context of how different diseases affect women and men differently. A lot of the research that's been done when it's published doesn't distinguish how much of the cohort of patients that were involved were men or women. So they're kind of grouped together. And that obviously then influences the outcome of the analysis that is done. So when you encountered this issue, when you said, this is obviously not right, what did you do? I think there's a famous quote, I think it was Malcolm X that said, it actually, that if not now, when, if not you, then who kind of thing. And I think I having been grown up professionally in the industry and then you get to a level of seniority etc where you kind of think okay and you see that I see this with other women as well who are sort of focused on these sorts of topics it's like if others aren't going to take this seriously and do something about it then who's going to do it well we are we're going to go and raise awareness about it and invest in it and hopefully (laughs) make a positive impact in, in addressing some of the gaps that we see. But it's a long journey. I don't think it's something that's necessarily going to be fixed overnight and not at all. But I I think one of the things that I've really enjoyed hearing in certainly in the past 12, 18 months or so, there's quite a lot of momentum building up behind this because people are starting to see that. And there's also research coming out as well around it and data that supports it, that actually this is really important for global economy. And, you know, if half your population is not healthy and well, then that's going to have a fundamental impact on the political stability and economic output of the country that they're in. So yeah, it's been quite interesting to sort of see also just not in terms of the business side of things, but how governments are also starting to pay attention and look into how do you sort of address some of these gaps. Is that something that you're actively involved in, is talking with government entities about these issues? I wouldn't say actively involved. I do obviously have some dialogue with different stakeholders within the ecosystem. But I think for me, given my sort of more corporate commercial background, I look at it in terms of how we do we address it from a business perspective? How can we address it from a technical perspective? There's obviously an education. So how do we? (laughs) How do we? we? (laughs) I think there's a couple of things. I mentioned sort of the diagnosis side of things. AI has so much potential and we see it already being used in terms of the aiding diagnosis of conditions. I mean, we see it in terms of the the MRI images and the mammograms, the the x-rays, et cetera, that are taken and can AI be used to help to identify 
breast cancer or lung cancer or looking at the pap spheres and using AI to detect cervical cancers, you know, things like that. So I think it's been some really great examples in terms of aiding diagnosis. There's also the scientific piece of it as well. So the new treatments that are coming and that are available, AI being used to sort of look for new indications associated with existing drugs, but having new indications that could be relevant for different conditions and things like that, and AI being used for that, and sort of trying to match existing drugs to rare diseases as well, because interestingly, there's a higher percentage of people, of women with rare diseases, then there are men. This just seems to be a higher prevalence within the female community. So that's the sort of element around it as well. I'm also starting to see, because obviously we have this data gap now, you know, 30 years we're missing data from the clinical trials that have been conducted. How, what do we do to address that? So I'm starting to see some really great examples of using AI to create synthetic data sets, for example, and things like that, which could hopefully expedite some of the, or close some of that gap. I think it does also need to be used with a degree of caution because we are dealing with people's health. And of course, there's data privacy sort of elements around this, particularly if you're using genetic data, et cetera, as part of the models and things. And you're also, you know, there's an element of how comfortable are patients with, how do they trust the algorithms? Do they trust the outcome of those algorithms? Are they being used ethically, for example? Are people, the people using them and developing them, taking that into consideration when they're right. being created? I want to dig into mm. that in mm -hmm. a minute. My mind immediately, as you're talking about using AI as a diagnostic yeah. tool, based on the data, it, you said it's coming up with synthetic data. Is that to fill the gaps? Yeah, in some, in of, some cases it can. Because historically our data is biased yeah, yeah. when it comes to studying yeah. so it, it the can, different sexes. Yeah, it, it can be used. I mean, I'm starting to see examples of that being used, which um, it definitely has potential there. As you said, there is bias in the data. There's bias in the algorithms that are developed because it's not the silver bullet to be able to solve all problems, but we do need to be aware of what some of the limitations of it are, and particularly those that are, you know, if there's biases in society, which we know there are, then the, those biases are going to be represented in the algorithms that are developed. And, and I think that doesn't just apply to women, but also minority groups as well. Yeah, and people with different ethnicities, etc. So, I mean, I always find it funny when we, I mean, minority groups is a, it's an interesting statement. And often women get considered to be a minority group and what that means is the minority within the data but given that we make up half the world population it, it seems odd to me that we are considered a minority but then there's obviously subsets of female population which are also even more of a minority within those groups. right historically yeah. underrepresented yeah. right yeah. yeah this is i think one of the challenges of our time as we lean more into AI is <laughs> we are basing our training data sets on human historical yeah. data and the baked in biases mm -hmm. back in the 60s and 70s it was very much like well we need to combat mm -hmm. prejudice by not teaching our children prejudice <laughs> right and now AI is essentially a yeah. child of humanity mm -hmm. in a way Tell me about, and this, this could be a personal story, it can be a professional story, but tell me about the first time you encountered AI. Oh, that's a good question. So I think it's one of those things that I'm not necessarily sure that you're always aware that you're being exposed to AI. And I actually think that's one of the best forms of AI when you can't actually even tell that you're using it. I think when my first time I actually really recognized that I was, uh, it, I was having some conversations with a customer actually a life sciences company probably about 2016 or something like that and we were looking at developing a chat bot which would enable them to engage with healthcare professionals around some of the products that they had available and of course they were looking at using ai as part of that and around about the same time i was doing my phd but i was looking at sort of how chronic and life-threatening conditions are represented online so in, the, in terms of the patient narrative. And one of the things that I looked at was how this death manifests itself online. And at the time, there were some companies that were starting to 
enable people to or use the historical data of people who prior to their death had used on social media and then you feeding that into a model to then sort of post death be able to have almost this representation of them after their passing and we were looking at it in you know one of the topics around that is the ethics of that how does that affect for example the grieving process there's a psychological element around does that aid grief or does it make life more difficult for people who then can't process their grief because you've got an algorithm chatting to them and sending them messages etc which is representative of a deceased relative it's a difficult space to be in in terms of what is okay and what is not but those are sort of things that were starting to be exposed and come to the forefront in 2016 or so yeah that's literally an episode of black mirror <laughs> that no it really is <laughs> It's heartbreaking. I remember thinking at the time, you know, because you always reflect on it yourself in terms of, would I be okay with that? And I can understand to some extent, you know, if if you've got young children or, you know, somebody passed suddenly and things like that. But I can't imagine that that is a healthy way to process. You said we were studying it. So what were some of the findings? Uh, Well, so those were just emerging at the time. One of the things that we were looking at was, you know, it depends what people share as they're going through their dying days. What do people sort of share about their experiences of dying and the treatment and the care that they get and the support that they get, actually, because there's a lot of emotional support that gets given to people in online communities. And although there's a lot of you know, there's always the risk of trolling, et cetera, et cetera. But actually, with some of those communities, you really don't see a lot of that. You get to see some of the best of humanity, I think, as well as some of the worst of humanity in these sorts of settings. But it was interesting at the time because we'd done some research around the ethics of mining that sort of health data online. And at the time, there was no real guidance around it given for researchers or you know, computer scientists and things. I remember having a dialogue over the computer science and said we don't really care about ethics and that was the sort of statement that was made and now this was almost 10 years ago now now obviously things have changed since then there's a lot of ethical discussions going on around what you should and shouldn't do with people's data particularly in this context as well and I think it shouldn't be dismissed and I know there's a lot of people that are campaigning to make sure that with all the benefit and all the potential that AI has all the great things it can do for society we don't want it to do harm as well. So that's something that I know there's a lot of people putting quite a bit of attention to. Now, at Based Life Sciences, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. tell me whether or not you're allowed to talk about your work there. Uh, <laughs> but from what I understand, you help develop technology for clients. Yeah, I mean, right? so what we do is we're, like I said, a business and technology consulting company. And what we do is support our customers to be able to kind of create efficiencies in their process and adopt new technologies to enable them to to get more treatments to market. We develop sort of AI solutions that are sort of enabled through some of the other technology platforms that exist. There's a lot of potential there. I mentioned the fact that there's a lot of manual effort involved because you've got all these sort of disparate data sources, lots of different types of data, things like that, doing the the tech side of things and the AI solutions that are around it, but also how do you enable that or how does that address the business challenge that other organizations are facing? So that's where we kind of support. And that can be around content creation, you know, new dossiers that are going to be submitted to regulators for approval. It can be about review of those dossiers. You know, I mentioned about the structured and unstructured data. How do you use it to create efficiencies there as well? Yeah, so that's what we do. What's the attitude around AI that you're seeing amongst the companies? There's a lot of excitement around it. There's a lot of hype around it. There's a lot of companies that are doing a lot of proof of concepts around it. But one of the struggles that they face, particularly in life sciences, because there's a heavily regulated industry, is around how do you get it into production? How do you make it scalable? And so that sort of transfer into the production environment where it can be used is where we see organizations struggling the most. There's a lot of the the sort of pet projects, the little individual projects and use cases that are developed as part of these proof of concepts, but they're not necessarily taking into account, for example, the user experience of it. So 
how do you make sure that you're making it easy for a user to the point where they don't even know that they're using AI? Just like the way that we kind of use facial recognition to unlock our phones and stuff. I'm not sure people would mm -hmm. instinctively go, oh, yes, that must be AI. That You're not even thinking about it. It's just mm -hmm. part of the user mm -hmm. experience that you have. So looking at it in terms of its usability and baking it into the business processes seamlessly so that users don't even know that they're using it. You know, that's part of what we're trying to do. Are there any proofs of concept or pilot projects that, you know, obviously anonymize it, that you're seeing that like makes you lean forward and say, this could lead to something big. Even mundane things, they're like, oh, this is helping with yeah, these enormous headaches. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing is some of the use cases we've got is starting to see sort of like 80% anything between 30 and 80% time saving. Now, if you then reflect that in terms of how long it takes to get a, a drug through clinical development and then into sort of approved by the regulators and thing, or health authorities and things like that, that can take years. If you're starting to see sort of efficiency gains like that, that's really exciting because that means that there's potential to, to get new treatments to market quicker, which given what we've said around some of the conditions that are we're still looking for treatments around, but, you know, and, and still doing research around. I think that as a society that has implications for population segments that are affected by these diseases. So that's really exciting to see. I think the other thing I'm also excited to see is how it's applied. in. so we also do work in sort of remote patient monitoring. So using digital biomarkers as part of the clinical trials, either in the design of the trial or the you know, conduct of the trial. For those of us who may not be in the know, what are digital biomarkers? <laughs> it's a defined characteristic and a measurable indicator of a certain type of biological process or response okay. to an intervention. So it's how your body responds to either to a disease or a treatment using a digital endpoint. It's helpful and it's also kind of mind-blowing that <laughs> that's even a thing. As a recipient of healthcare, yeah, yeah. knowing that... I'm creating digital endpoints yeah. with my body, essentially, yeah. is just kind of mind-blowing. Let's talk about patient experience mm -hmm. for a minute. We talked about having a patient dossier mm -hmm. with AI helping to speed up that data collection mm -hmm. and, and communication to the provider. How is AI changing patient experiences or even clinical study experiences? I mean, we talked about the diagnosis piece. So I think if it can aid diagnosis that hopefully it would mean that patients are diagnosed quicker than they have been historically, particularly when I mentioned about women are often later to be diagnosed than men for certain conditions. So if AI can help with that from a patient experience perspective, it can be used to kind of tailor. Well, so each patient is unique, as we know, their family history around a certain condition or the genetic makeup that they have, the social influences, etc. And being able to sort of use AI to kind of customize care plans and things like that and sort of align support resources for those sort of individuals and the unique needs that they have, that really sort of has a lot of potential. So hopefully, ultimately, patients would experience better care as a consequence of that and better and tailored care to whatever their needs are. And then as that's part of their care journey, but also that the treatments that they get are going to be effective in them. So I guess it's an indirect way of enhancing the patient experience. I guess one of the questions that comes to mind for me as a non-medical mm. professional, as you further personalize treatment, mm. right? As you further personalize mm -hmm. drug yeah. cocktails and whatnot, how does that impact the studies on the back mm. end that come to those? It's very, it's very, very different. I mean, a really good example of that is sort of cell and gene therapies where it actually it's not a you know one treatment fits all kind of thing it's actually specific treatment that is tailored specifically to that individual because it's based on their either a sample of their cells or a, a sample of their blood etc so that is really changing fundamentally changing the, the business model that exists within the industry there's a lot of potential around that and I know a lot of organizations are sort of researching and, and investing into that space. And that will continue, I think. We will certainly continue to see that, I'm sure. Because that is the ultimate personalized treatment because 
you're basically getting a treatment that is specific to you and cannot be used in somebody else because it's made for you. And then obviously the AI, I mean, that's something where you really do need to scale it and AI can help with that that scale. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's interesting. I don't know. I haven't come across of any examples yet of AI being used in the cell and gene therapy space, but I'm sure there are probably some out there. And there's a lot of activity around it. And there's always new things that are coming up, and I'm excited to see what can be done for the benefit of the industry and society as a consequence of that. That was my next question is like, talk to me more about what you're excited about. What are you seeing that you're like, this has the most potential? You talked about the speed mm. to market and getting rid of the inefficiencies. What else are you seeing? I'm seeing a lot more investment in the space, which is great because I think that I'm seeing a lot more awareness around it. There's a lot more organizations sort of and people educating themselves around what is the potential of it. I think it was considered a bit of a buzzword for a while. And also something that was included in people's performance objectives and things like that. We must do AI. And it's like, okay, AI for what purpose? You know, we need to look at, okay, what is going to be either the business benefit or the sort of extended benefit associated with that? I'm excited to sort of see all the sort of great momentum and the investments that are being made, the activity that organizations are doing, the advocacy I'm seeing around it, particularly around women's health issues and things like that. There's a lot of momentum there, and I hope to see that continue. That's the sort of stuff I'm excited to be part of and to be able to contribute towards. Is there anything that you're working on next that you're excited about in your specific work? Yeah, I mean, I think from a women's health perspective, I'm excited to see some of the, the really amazing startups that are starting to emerge that are specifically looking at women's health topics and how AI can be applied to that. And that's not just, as I've mentioned before, around things like the, you know maternal or reproductive health, but more broadly across other conditions as well. This is not just sort of big pharma and consulting and healthcare systems being part of it, but actually the startup ecosystem is also contributing in quite a innovative and pragmatic way as well which is good to see particular startup that you were intrigued by lately oh this i mean there's so many i mean i came across one recently that was really looking into sort of facial and mood recognition how that can be used in the healthcare context that's around if you're going through certain treatments whether it be oncology treatment for example where it's not a fun patient journey that not at all it can be quite depressing for folk as they're going through those things so using that information to kind of inform the care that people receive, I think is quite exciting to see. I've seen some really great ones around, like I mentioned, breast cancer detection and things like that. I've seen some around reproductive health, so, you know, using temperature as a way to predict fertility cycles and things like that. So yeah, there's some really good stuff coming through and that's great to see. Anything else that we have not talked about that you wanted to discuss? I'm a very pragmatic kind of person. So I know that AI, is, there's a lot of hype around it. There's a lot of buzzwords around it and things like that. I'm hoping we will get to a point where, you know, that hype curve is sort of slowed down and we kind of get into more of the pragmatism around it. And I think that will only come when people are more educated around it and educated around not just the technology side of things, but the implications of it, whether it be in the women's health space or they're around the ethics of using it and things like that. So I know we sort of covered some of those topics as well, but I think sort of education and, and awareness and preparing for the future and things like that. We will see looking at the talent for the future and what sort of talent do we as an organization and our customers need to be able to fulfill some of these, the potential, what roles will exist in the future that we don't know about now that we need to prepare for and how do we make sure that we're educating, upskilling, cross-skilling, all that good stuff to be able to fulfill the potential that exists. Those are big conversations. Yeah. In, in other episodes, we're yeah. talking about upskilling yeah, and yeah. reskilling across all kinds of yeah. industries. What do you think will be happening in the life sciences space in terms of upskilling and reskilling and AI literacy? I know there's a lot of stuff going on around it. I think people are educating themselves, whether it's through external courses or organizations are also providing that training to their employees as well. So I imagine that's going to be an entire solution. You know, that could be an entire line of business. It's just 
how do we equip this company with AI skills? Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. So it's, it's an interesting space to be in. I'm curious to see how it is and I'm excited to see how it is in 10 years time. Because I remember, you know, when things like cloud was first introduced decades ago, there was a lot of excitement around that. And now that is just sort of normal part of business. And I think we'll start to see AI becoming that in the future, which will be will be good. I mean, people used to talk a lot about robotics and things like that, remote robotic process automation and things like that. And those are things that are already part of what exists already. But that's sort of how the emerging tech sort of then gets embedded in the way that we operate and people don't even think about it anymore or sort of see it as a as a different or unusual way of working. When I have these conversations with people, I'm just like, what a time to be alive, you know? <laughs> Speaking of women's health, we could be born in the 1950s yeah, yeah. or the 1940s yeah, yeah. and an entirely different existence than right now. And although we were staring down the barrel of a lot of big challenges, ethics and job yeah. loss, potential job loss, but also job yeah, gains job because well. there's going to be yeah. an entire industry. These conversations yeah. remind yeah. me, wow, what yeah, a time yeah. to be alive. And it's, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff happening. And I think I'm curious to see how it is in five, 10 years time and, and the progress that has been made. And hopefully we can make up, start closing the gap of 30 years of data gap that we have and, and can sort of start to see some of the impacts on the women's health issues and things like that as a consequence of it. So. Well, thank you for spearheading this, or not necessarily spearheading, but definitely forging a path forward for the conversations yeah. and educating people I think about we, these issues. Yeah, we all have a role to play. And I think having benefited from my professional growth journey and things like that, it's now time to actually take that and do something that's that's kind of meaningful. I think it's also important to point out that it's not just the job of people with female bodies. Correct. Point yeah. out the yeah. gap and do something yeah, yeah. about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of allyship. We just had International Women's yeah, Day. Yeah. We just had International Women's Day and there was a lot of chatter on LinkedIn about like, you know, wishing International Women's Day, happy International Women's Day means nothing unless you're actually yeah. doing something. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I know there's people that argue, well, should we really have a day and where's international you know, men's day and et cetera? Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I would like us to get to a point on a personal level that we don't necessarily have to have these days because it's actually just part of where we are as society. But I do like to use them as an, an opportunity to celebrate the progress that has been made and the bright future that exists and the women in our lives and people in our lives that are contributing to that. So I see it more as an opportunity to recognize, reflect, and celebrate, which is always, a, I think, a healthy thing to do in general. So, Well, Joe, thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting me and for the very nice discussions.